good afternoon, everyone. I love being in the presence of people that I can grow from. There are so many nuggets and very powerful pieces that have been laid along the way. And you know, success leaves clues, right? So sometimes as we travel in life, we see things as rocks, but often you need to look closer to see that there are gold nuggets that you can pick up along the way. So I'm hoping today to share some nuggets. I will say thank you very much, Steph, when she reached out to me, we are house on the rock, yes. When we're on the journey called life, we have exits off the ramp. We have entrances back on the ramp. We have exits off and exits back on. So I will be talking a little bit about what is required to make the exit that may end up being a ramp onto something else. Because I'm planning on 30 more years, OK, at least on this world. I'm going to start a little bit by sharing my story, and we'll get into that. I'm life coaching now but I use an awakening model. And one thing I would say, I loved where you talked about beginnings. And Steph, I had an experience this week where someone reached out to me, it was on Instagram, and we ended up meeting face to face, and she shared with me that someone had told her that she must meet me. And she began to lay down the story to me, and it, it lets you know you never know who you will touch, and you never know what impact you have. So you just need to be consistently persistent in doing what you are called to do, the blessings will come. In this situation, I founded something called Our Time. Whatever your R is, rejuvenation, renewal, refresh, Our Time re Retreat. And I did it for the first time, as Petrinia speaks, in 2018. So that was almost two years before I left employment before I retired from Shell. This retreat, I expected 15 intimate people, and we en ended up having like four. Four. But the funny thing about it is the lady who told, who was my testimonial, so to speak, the story that I learned from the lady that I met last week was that this woman that was in my retreat was in an abusive relationship, not believing in herself, feeling hopeless, and as a result of our time together, she now had self-worth, she picked herself up out of that situation, and she now believed, because she'd never learned any of the things that we had talked about in her upbringing. We talk about belief. A lot of the things that we grew up with are not worthy to be in our bags anymore. We need to drop it off. We need to not just keep things because everybody else has been doing it, or that's how we do it in our family. So we interjected and changed her environment and I absolutely had no idea that the woman was going through that. The testimony that she gave, she said, it was like I just saw her yesterday, all the things that, that I've known. This woman thought I had seen her six months ago. I said, no, this was two years ago. And I've absolutely never ever heard from the lady. So I didn't know what impact I had. So I say today, the deposits, the residue, the, emo the aroma that you bring into the space is very, very, very important. Your energy. A lot of times people, people don't really get it sometimes. It's like, how are you lifting me and you're not even saying anything? Our vibration matters. When we talk about spirit and how we connect with people, people pick up, just like babies, for example. It's not words that you're using to communicate, is it? I've got a new grandbaby, so I'm really into when I look at him you know, the, just the joy that passes. So people feel when you are bringing something good. So putting yourself in a position where you can bring that positive, I mean, that's a lot of what we've learned today. So starting, you will have impact. Reach one, that one will reach a thousand. So just believe that and keep marching on. So my story, real quick, Petrinia, let's keep going. I don't have the thing, but. These are some of the brands that I've worked with. Just to give you a quick overview. I know it shows on me completely. What do they say? Hopefully you don't look like what you've been through. But I've worked continuously over 30 years. Okay? And we talked about, anybody know what a Harley Davidson motorcycle is? Like the most expensive bike in the world? Yeah. 
Okay, so I worked there for 10 years. Imagine steel toe shoes, sne um, jeans, right? Safety glasses, earplugs, t-shirt, and sometimes glove. Sometimes I was wearing a helmet for welding, because that's the kind of work I was doing. And that's what I did for 10 years, okay? Working in that environment. Um, again, Shell was there, partner at Phillips. Yeah, let's just go to what's my story. Thank you, even better. All right, so the story. I'm getting ready to tell you this story, okay. What do you notice about this picture? Huh? Courage, yes. What else do you notice? Dare, what else? Hmm? Joy, risk fulfillment. What I notice the most about this is this guy's face. He's looking at me like, who in the world? And what are you doing with that snake? Are you crazy? What's going on? And that's how it's been most of my life. People have looked at me and not quite figured out the what and the why. And you don't necessarily look like those things that you are. So I was born once in Salem, North Carolina, a little small town. Had a perfect life, right? Mama, daddy, two siblings, older siblings. And I was the youngest in my house. You asked me about my name. My mother and father were in a head-on collision about 11 months before I was born. My mother was in a coma, came out, and I was born the next year. So that's why my name is Petrinia Joy Lynn Wirtz, and then I added Onaha, okay? I was her joy baby. I was her unique one that had a purpose. So my mother gave me a lot of that and I bought it hook, line, and sinker. 13, my mother dies, boom. All of a sudden, it's just me and my father at home. And in that space, my father was the kind of traditional father, right? Not big on nurturing, he was the breadwinner. So what I learned very quickly is that the currency of my father's affection was achievement. So I kept achieving. I did well in school, I was in music, I was in drama, gift and talented, math and science did all of that, all right? Because that's where my father, my father's a pastor, by the way. He's been a pastor since he was 17. Preacher and teacher, my mother was a teacher. So for me, I then went from being this innocent child to now 13, actually running a household because my brother and sister were away, all right? And um, I always loved the arts. I loved to sing, I loved to dance, all of those things. But the career counselor said, you're great in math and science, so guess what I chose? engineering but I got informed and here's lesson number one I want you to take away I went to a summer program to learn all the engineering curriculums and the one that I found that was closest to people people and processes was industrial engineering and that's what I took so electrical would have been boring me to sleep and I would not have performed well at it because that's just not my gifting. My gifting is to relate with people. So I chose within the whole realm of things, the thing that I knew that I had a, a kindred spirit to. And while I was in school, I co-founded a theater company. Again, I was like, ah, this arts is calling me. I sat down with my brother, six years older than me, electrical engineer, and he said, Petrinia, I know, I know what you're thinking, because I went to talk to him to get guidance. Because I wanted to change my major. I wanted to go to history. I love history. And his whole thing to me was, you love to eat. History, theater, all that stuff, those people don't eat very often. Most of them are starving waitresses. So he got me. At 19, 20, I was ready to change my major. But I stayed on track with engineering and, you know, got good jobs. and. We reached a point, we were in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, so I met my African prince in college. So I've been married, for, we've been married for 33 years. And people looked at me strange then too, right? I don't know, in the 80s, and maybe this isn't the audience, but can anybody, did anybody grow up with good times where 
Thelma was going to marry the African prince, and the day before they got married, they found that the husband was going to take a second wife. So all black Americans believed if you marry a Nigerian, you will, yeah, when you go to the village, there will be plenty, plenty of other wives. Ah, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You have a career, you have a future, what are you doing? So anyway, I was used to being looked at, and it's okay. So, um, once we, you know, we started working, and he and I reached a point in our careers, because my husband's an engineer as well, that we were who everybody was looking up to in South Central PA. We also found out in our Nigerian society, there were so many kids who said their parents were Nigerian, but they did not define themselves that way. We also saw many people who Nigeria had spit out when they tried to come back. They couldn't really fit in because they didn't understand how to work in the environment. So they longed for that cultural connection, but they didn't know how to navigate. So my husband and I made a, a big, bold decision and decided that our value was to make sure that our children were not strangers in their father's land. So in 2003, we packed up everything. I cashed in my 401k. I never forget. I had just gotten into senior management at Harley. I cashed in my 401k. That's how much I was betting on this thing. And we relocated here in 2003. Now, when we were coming, it was like we were the only one on the highway. It was like everybody else was going the other direction. That's when I went to church, and they said, we're praying for visas. I said, what's a visa? What are you praying for? I didn't understand it. It's because. <laughs> We were doing something that people didn't quite get. What are you doing? You left, you left, you left, what? And guess what, guys, when I came, my first job, the salary was equal to the bonus that I had gotten the last year. But instead of money, I had someone who wanted to carry my bag. I had a vehicle, I had a big, 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 huge title. I could barely carry the title, it was so big. And I said, you know, I'd really rather have money because I was still stuck in the mindset of achievement, that achievement and that money that defines who I am. So imagine the repositioning that I had to go through of now. The money was down here. My husband was working for Shell in Port Harcourt, six days. So I was here with three very young children, one who was bargaining, you know, trying not to come here. He drop kicked the nanny. You know, he was just like, every, he was ready to go. Why did we even come? And I was working 13 hours at a bank, making the bonus that I, you know, it was just like, what the world? So when we talk about a shaking sometimes, and we talk about repositioning, it's important for you to get shaken so you can lose some of those pieces so that when you come back up, you're able to see and know and see things from a different light. I had to be repositioned in my value system to understand that I was not defined by the amount of money that I made. I was defined by the value that I bring to this earth. And I've known for a long time that my, I've, I've understood my purpose, so I'll get to that purpose in, in a little bit. So that experience for me was like a breakthrough. Because once you've had this amount of water to try to bathe all five of us, and most of that water was dead tall, but you still did it. We still kept getting up. We went to visit him, and he was in paradise. <laughs> and the kids were like, what's going on? But this too passed. Then I got the opportunity a year after being at Reliance Bank. I then had like three job opportunities. I went to Phillips Consulting, did passion work. And, and here's the second lesson I would just pass is for me, when I was at Harley Davidson, I volunteered and I've always been a volunteer. Public service, I believe that service is, is the rent that you pay to be on earth. And my, my lesson to you here would be, most of the things that I gained skills in and got jobs in since I've been in this country, have been things that I volunteered to do in the States. When I came for my first interview, I had my big book. I had all the articles, all the stuff. I mean, I had met, I'd done so many things outside of engineering. And I opened the book and I was showing the recruiter, because I just didn't have a resume. I had something called 
a parachute. And a parachute is when you jump out of the plane, you need to have a parachute to allow you to land. And that's what I call my book. Every project I worked on, I had a photocopy of the programs, the photos, the thank you notes. And if they didn't give me a thank you note, I would write a thank you note to the manager and say, thank you for giving me this project that was extra above and beyond. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn this skill and grow in this competence. And I had that, all of that nicely in my plastic parachute because I knew one day I would jump. In that interview, she was flipping and flipping and flipping, and she said, this thing looks like a compendium. So in America, we don't use that kind of word. I was like, oh, shoot, I got a master's degree. What, what? I don't even know what a compendium is. So I wasn't sure if she was complimenting me or insulting me. So you know how you just play along and try to get a little more context. But at the end of the day, it was truly OK to be as diverse as I was. I became very OK with having broader interests than just building motorcycles. I worked on a Black History Quiz Bowl. For 10 years, I managed that program. Comple no, not on any work schedule anywhere, but it was a passion. Because I remember when I was seven years old, eight years old, and I found a Black History book. Well, maybe what I didn't tell you is, I was the youngest in the family. You know how we have colorism? I'm the darkest child. I look like my father. My sister looked like my beautiful mother, right? So for me, it was lucky she was smart. Right. So when I looked in the book and I saw Mary McLeod Bethune, a tall, dark-skinned, big woman like me. I saw Constance Motley. I saw Maggie, Maggie Lena um, Baker. All of these were people who had, who showed me and role model the woman that I could be. So even when I was at Harley Davidson, I had senior leaders ask me, where'd you get your confidence from? And what I said to them is, why don't you have confidence? My father told me every day, make your presence felt. So that's, that's how I lived my life. So when I then went to Phillips Consulting, absolutely loved the work. I loved consulting and being with people. And I was traveling all over the place, loved it. Changing organizations, changing people's lives. But by the time I had my fifth child, it was time to not fly so much. And I got a call. And it was a lady who had come into Nigeria as an American, married to a Nigerian. I had befriended, not seen her for a long time. She called me and offered me the job at Shell. Another lesson. When we give, we get. When I invited her, I know it's not easy settling into here. I'm involved with the American Women's Club and Niger Wives. There are many people come and they cut and run. And it's not just foreigners, so let's be clear. Even in our Nigerian society, some of us propose that people learn languages, Yoruba and Igbo, and those women looked, it was two of us, American Samaritan, and the women looked at us like we had three eyes. They said, why do we want to teach them the language? Why do you think we came to America? And for me, I understand the importance of culture. I understand the connectedness to give you pride in who you are because like I said history is important to me and black history so at the end of the day um, my story would <laughs> this has gotten too long my story is about jumping and realizing that other people may not get your vision at the time that you're getting it because a lot of people thought hmm, don't you know that once I went down because things happen in patterns and you could see that in the um, previous talks that were going on. When I came down and that was five million a year in that job, then I grew up. When I got the call for the shell job, what was it? It was like, ah, oh, comes with a house, comes with this, come, I was coming up. And wow, I came much higher than I would have ever gotten if I would have stayed back in what I knew in, Shell, in um, Harley Davidson. In fact, in 2008, nobody was able to buy $20,000 motorcycles, and most of the people I knew there were laid off. So jumping. So jumping is a book, um, Mike Lewis. 
and again, once you talk to people, you see patterns. So I'm gonna share with you just four phases of the jump curve. The first one is listen to that little voice. Listen to that little voice. It comes and whispers to you. Oftentimes we need to create some quietness to be able to do that. Some of us have a volume so loud on our life. You ever feel sometimes that we're keeping busy because we're trying to avoid dealing with stuff? That avoidance doesn't get you closer to your authentic self. It keeps you further away. So listen to that little voice. Next thing you do is begin to make a plan, prepare. Don't just up and quit because out of frustration and you're upset. Make a plan, save, learn, grow. Number three, let yourself be lucky. Just go for it. And last, number four is don't look back once you do. Okay, so the reinvention roadmap. I followed this to, to an extent, but essentially, in my life, I needed to get altitude. And by getting altitude, that means stepping back, building your awareness, and understanding some of your giftings, for example. Seeing more possibilities. Have you noticed that when you're, even in movies, right? When you're on the ground and you're trying to shoot someone, they always say, go to the top of the building and then you have a better view of things. So get altitude on your possibilities. Find a path because you can see more when your awareness is higher. If you wanna bounce a ball, you gotta put the air in before you bounce it. So more joy is about that gratitude. Spending time on focusing on what you do have will then attract more things that you can be grateful for, right? So there are a lot of elements in, in Mojo that I went through. I almost lost my husband, right? We went through severe brain, all kinds of neurosurgery. So having a plan to grow. Do you have a plan to grow? Because that thing that you're moving to, you must grow yourself in order to be prepared to receive it. If you don't change yourself, when the thing comes, you won't even spot it. It won't look like an opportunity. It'll look like a problem. So prepare yourself. Because in order to know your have a goal, you must now begin to exert some force. That's what growth looks like. That might be learning. That may be volunteering for an assignment at work, all right? Positioning yourself in the flow of opportunity is what that looks like when you begin to flow your own boat and not just let the current take you wherever. I've been in situations where I've been pooped on completely at work. I don't know if because I was a threat. I don't know if because, I don't know. But do I really care? I found a community that valued me and that's where I began to grow. When I went to conferences, for example, when I began to learn more, it wasn't necessarily cool. Can you imagine there was 200 white guys and me? It was 2,000 in the plant, but the first day I got there, they were touching my skin and said, we haven't had anybody like you before. So my mind had to be strong, guys. And when it wasn't strong, I had to have ways to replenish myself and through growing and learning. I went through Dale Carnegie. I went through things to help grow me. I did my MBA. Those guys thought I was crazy because most of them, you know, when I, was, uh, when I was in Pennsylvania, most of those guys were like, why are you working full time? You have two kids, then three kids, and you're driving in the evening to do your MBA. I said, Mug, they're paying for it. Why wouldn't I go? They were a lot more interested in having beer in the evenings, and those are the guys that were laid off, that 2008, you know? But I had equipped myself. So be in the learning so that you can grow, move toward a purpose, right? I knew my, my purpose was always to improve the human condition. I knew that when I was a very little girl. And in the late 90s, I decided, and I saw myself in front of people speaking. And my brother always said, you have a ministry, you're going to be the one that's the pastor, right? He always told me that. So I'm embracing it now. I'm embracing it because I'm beginning to live my dreams and set new goals. So I'm going to give you some just quick ones because this is transformation. For me, people's level of decisions when we talk about exits and, and entrances, I think it follows along Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So for me, in the beginning, I was scared, right? I went into engineering because I didn't want to starve. 
So I was taking care of my very low level needs of physiological and safety, right? Security, food, shelter. And I made my decision based on my awareness and based on my needs. Once I took care of those, I began to then make higher level, higher leverage decisions because my hierarchy of needs were changing, right? I now love and belonging, being in an organization I could grow in, being in communities that I could grow in. I chose my work accordingly throughout my career. And then the esteem and speaking and doing things with clients, Phillips Consultant was spot on for that because I had options at KPMG to do more engineering and, and material velocity work. And I knew that wasn't my calling. I had the skill, but I had choices now because as your awareness grows, your opportunities and what you're able to see changes. And then in my last move, 2018, 2000, end of 2017 really did it for me. I knew I was being called for something higher and different than buying and selling and doing million dollar real estate deals, which I loved as well. I love negotiating and running large um, portfolios in real estate. But I knew I was being called for something more. End of 2017, I walked into a real estate conference where I was a speaker. And I ran into two people that I had trained over 13 years ago. And they both ran up to me and said, I remember exactly what you trained me. This one was now in charge of IFC in Washington, D.C. So I took it as a sign. I said, Lord, you're trying to talk to me. So anyway, I went into um, John Maxwell was a way for me to get into that community again. And now I'm flowing. So let me just flow here and say, having your goalposts being clear of your end state. You ever done those mazes like you have in school? You ever done a maze? I learned early on that if I start at the end of the maze and work back, I'm a lot more successful. I'm faster than everybody else. But that's how life is too. Because sometimes when you start at the beginning, all you see are the obstacles. All you see is that guy looking at you and saying, well, maybe I should put the snake down. Maybe my power is too strong for these folks. Maybe I can't even handle it. But if you link on to the there, and you trace it back, clarity comes. Uh, so what I wanted to bring out, and I think this part is really important, and I'll just stop early, and you can share the slides if you want to. In order to have your there, you must know where you are right now. So for some in the room, as, as I look around, I think it's worthwhile for you to know that there are seven key career archetypes. You've got the seekers, right? Those are the people usually early in their career, right? They're looking, they're trying to learn, they're hungry, trying to make it happen. You've got the prodigies. And the reason I'm going through this is I want you to spot yourself. If you're looking at a career exit, off-ramping on something, you need to be clear, where are you? Now, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they have a higher appreciation or valuation of themselves than their organization or their customers do. I'm sure that's not anyone in here. But, but, but just in case, if you're the kind of person that, number one, just compares yourself against what's inside your organization, that's a mistake, okay? A lot of shell people have that problem, very insular. I never fit into that because I've always been external because I understand that's where the real, real problems are and that's the real world. So always measure internally and externally. Have associations. That's what prodigies do, right? Prodigies are those high flyers in the organization and they are coached and mentored and have a strong network. That's how they remain on the high potential list. The movers and shakers are just more mature prodigies. What they should be doing is reaching to try to bring other people up, right? To mentor, be, be part of networks. If this is you, right, and you're saying, what type of exit do I want to make? You need to begin to think about, are, is it other organizations that I want to move and shake in? Is it a different industry? Is it the same industry? When I am at those organizations or associations, am I just sitting with people that I already know? Or am I really expanding my network? Am I offering solutions? When I meet people now, I often ask, 
how can I add value to you? Remember my friend that I added value to who offered me a job that really was a game changer for me, okay? So when you're moving and shaking, don't get all, ooh, I'm VP this and I'm at the top of my game. Remember to reach back. Each one, reach one, teach one, eroto, okay? Each one should be reaching at least one and teaching one. Steady progressors. Those are folks that uh, may be plateaued, but kind of hanging out there. Those, those folks need to have a rejuvenation. Does anybody feel like they may be just a steady progressor? They've just kind of moved along the way the organization has moved. You've been floating in the boat, not really guiding where you're going. Any assignment they give you is fine. You don't keep up with the newest projects or read the newspaper to see how something externally might be shaping your industry and coming and proposing something new. Steady progressors, if you leave an organization and you're just a steady progressor, you're gonna have a problem when you meet the real world because you're not gonna have enough hunger. You're not gonna have enough ingenuity. You need to work on your agility. When you go down the basketball court, you can't walk down the court and expect to score. You've gotta build your skills by running suicides when nobody's looking. You know what suicides are, right, in basketball? Where you run and go back and go back and go back. Uh-huh. So we're not killing ourselves. I'm not advocating that. Okay. Lay bloomers. Those are folks that sometimes just later in their life, maybe they started later, all right? A lot of us women sometimes when we've gone off the track and come back on. Stabilizers or stabilized. I've gotten there, said a while. And stabilized kind of means that this may be a point in my life where other things are more important than the work. Okay, that might be I'm taking care of an older parent, so I'm working longer, shorter hours, or I have a young child, I'm working shorter hours. But it's more like something else is the priority. So that's really not a time to make huge decisions around exiting, is it? Unless you've done the plan, the jump curve. Remember the jump curve. You must plan for it. And last but not least, are you the guy that's already checked out? but going nowhere. If you checked out and going nowhere, wake up! Yes. When you wake up, it's your morning. So start the awakening process because checked out and, and, not, and going nowhere, if you step out, you're just gonna be checked out in another environment. You need to turn it on and get it working. All right. Um, Competencies that will allow you to succeed from 9,000 job benchmarks, and I'll, I'll just stop here, is personal accountability. If someone in your team does not have personal accountability, please send them to your competitor. Personal accountability would be the person who describes that something didn't happen because somebody else didn't do something. Not about owning, right? Goals orientation. So personal accountability, if you can't get that right in, right in the workplace, it's quite unlikely that you'll be able to get that right anywhere because it's a muscle, guys. You don't um, lift the heavy weight the first time you try. You've got to practice it. Goals orientation as opposed to what? What do you think the opposite of this might be? Hmm? Financial. So goals orientation versus task orientation. I always say, Unless the customer feels it, it didn't happen. And what I mean by that, internal, my department did their part, my task was done. But the goal was to get the new product out to the customer, which had three or four more steps. So if you're goal oriented, you're trying to get the new product to the customer. If you're task oriented, you're just covering your backside saying, my task is covered. But if the customer didn't feel it, what is that eventually gonna do to your business, okay? Continuous learning. I did all of that with the comfort zone to the growth zone. If you didn't get that, we can do a rewind maybe afterwards. Interpersonal skills. We've heard so much about the interpersonal skills, and that's what I love. We start on a technical path in our career, but if we want to lead and influence people, I was, I was coaching someone yesterday, and she could not envision multiplying herself. As she was visioning what she wanted in her 10-year plan, all she could see is what she could do with her hands. 
So I knew that we had a leadership issue. Interpersonal skills help you and the soft skills help you to know how to influence and lead others, right? And communicate your ideas. I remember my first job, I had been used to memorizing long theater poems and stuff, right? I would get in meetings, have the idea, but I couldn't articulate it. I couldn't, could, you know, and I stuttered a little bit when I was younger. So I, if you build some of these skills, you're able to speak in terms of the other person's interests. You're able to tune into WIIFM is what's in it for me. Everybody's listening. What's in it for me? So if you can use that orientation when you're communicating, that's an outcome of good interpersonal skills. And my, my brother has really served us up on resiliency. But be able to bounce. When trouble comes, bounce. I'm closing with, don't fear failure, fear regret. Don't leave the reason that God deposit, he put you on this earth deposit into you. Don't, don't leave it undone. Don't die full, die empty. Our intentions become our reality. Our intentions truly are the emotions around the goals that we set for ourselves. And for people who just float along and anywhere they end up is okay, then know you run the risk of your tombstone saying, died at 30, buried at 60. Don't be that guy. And you see the other points. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Wherever you are, no matter where you aspire to be, we are committed to grow you there. All right. Thank you so much.